Welcome to Security Architecture Podcast, where we help cybersecurity professionals to stay ahead of the curve and ensure they are successful in their cybersecurity journey. Hi, I'm Evgeny. Hi, I'm Dimitri. We have Frederick today from Glibs to talk about his company and his role in the company as well. Can you please tell us about yourself and the company? Hi, I'm Frederick Golo. I'm the co-founder of LIMS, a French cybersecurity startup that we created four years ago in France. And as part of this journey of entrepreneurship, I moved to Canada to open our first international office. At Glimpse, what we do is malware detection and investigation using artificial intelligence to protect any kind of file flows. So all your file flows, we work mostly with big companies that have lots of files to handle, but also with MSSP that want to protect the files of their clients. At Glimpse, I'm the director of research. So I drive the research teams that develops our AI algorithm in, in particular. I designed some of, of, of them myself in the early times of Glimpse. And of course, I'm also a CEO of Glimpse Inc., our subsidiary in Canada. Thank you. So, Frederick, let's start from the basics. How would you define a malware and how it differentiates from a virus that we always hear about in the news? Yeah, the, the virus is basically the old word that we heard about malicious files that spread within computer systems and so on. Malware is a bit more generic term for a virus that includes all the kind of malicious software that might harm a computer. So that contains a virus, of course, this kind of self-propagating worms that contains also uh, ransomwares, botnets, information stealers, for example. All these are uh, families of malware that we try to get rid of in our system. If we're talking about malware, what kind of malwares we can see and who's behind these malwares? Uh, right now, the landscape in the cybersecurity threat groups is quite wide. We have threat actors, full-fledged countries. We have also terrorist groups. We also have criminal groups that are behind malware. So they are a bit different. So the motivations basically between all those groups are quite different. Sometimes there might be a link between those. We've seen quite often threat actors working with either terrorists or a malicious actor and hire them basically to conduct some cyber operation. And yeah, all those... Actors, they do some malicious activities like denial of service, like stealing information, and also trying to take control usually of foreign or any kind of computer systems. And in doing that, that's where they use malwares to either enter the system or to get information from them. It's interesting because when we mentioned virus, and we go back like 20 years ago, 15 years ago, 10 years ago even, the idea was, oh, USB keys, oh, even floppy drives or whatever it is. <laughs> but it's really changed for the last 10 years. The common vector of attack is different. We're browsing the web. We're always connected. We have email. From your research and with your customers you guys have, what do you guys see is the most common vector of attack? The most common vector attack that we see, basically the, the most common chain starts usually with an email. Targeted email, more and more targeted. That's what we're seeing now. Two years ago, three years ago, we had some widespread email where the attackers tried to send email to 1,000 people, for example, from a company and hope that one of them will open uh, the attachment. Now, the emails are a bit more targeted and customized to the target to ensure that it will trigger their interest to ensure that they will click on link or execute the attached file. So that takes us to the next step. Next step is usually either file attachment, office document, PDF file, sometimes unexecutable, but it's becoming more rare because basically they are blocked by policies in email servers. If it's not an attached file, it's a link. Previously, it was a link on some custom servers, but now those are blocked. So now we see mostly links to Google Drives, Dropbox, this kind of platform that basically sizes cannot block because they might be useful for legitimate purpose. But on those platform, we find usually the next stage of the attack. And that's where the malware enters into play. The user is tricked into opening this file on its computer, executing it, eventually activating either embedded script or macros. And that's where 
the attacker takes control of the computer of the victim. And that's usually how it starts. I'm wondering, like you guys specialize in malware analysis, but you mentioned email and you mentioned other like functionalities and products. Why the email product is not enough? Why the antivirus that build into them or the detection system built into them is not enough? Today, what we see in antivirus is that they try to target what we call common threats, non-threats. They look for patterns and for signatures of threats that they know about and block them, of course. So they do a great job at that, we have to say. They block many common threats. But what we see is we have a lack of finding what we call not only a virus and ransomware, but also some malicious behaviors or suspicious behaviors. And when we talk with CISOs, for example, and we tell them we have the capability of detecting non-threats, but also some behaviors in file that are not legitimate. And some of them might be, you can have, we've seen that, we need a company, the people, I don't know if it was in the accounting department, they shared some Excel documents with macros, and within these macros, there was the functionality of downloading a file on a remote server and execute it. And that was legitimate. That was expected. That was, they were working with that. But when we explain that to the CISO and tell him, okay, we've detected this file as malicious, but the people tell us that it's not and it's legitimate, the CISO tells, no, I don't want this on my IT. I will tell my accountant team that it's forbidden to do that. So I want to detect malicious files and non-viruses, but also this kind of behavior, because I don't want my people in my company, basically, to have this kind of behaviors on their computers. Very interesting. So based on what you're saying, there is the aspect of social engineering to make that user to kind of click. But then, actually, there is additional effort of how you build your malware in such way that the current anti-malware solutions will not detect it, right? So it will go past them and will be able to run and perform its exploitative logic. Yeah, exactly. What we see quite often for attackers group is that when they have a new target or when they have been detected, they will reuse their code. And that's obvious. I mean, they are just like any software development company. They reuse 99% of their code between versions. But what they will do to avoid detection by antiviruses is, for example, changing the build tool chain, changing options from the compiler, this kind of thing. And by doing that, they completely change the expression of the malware, the compiled version of the malware. And all the patterns that the antiviruses were looking for are not present anymore. And that's how they usually evade detection by antiviruses. Interesting. So probably like even if you change the architectures that you said, right? I mean, hey, we have ARM architecture, right? We have Intel processors. It completely changes the picture or what's so-called static detection, right? Exactly. We often take the metaphor of books and stories. And the example is really... If I tell a story to someone, even a child, and the day after that, I tell the same story, but written differently, a different version of the same child story. The child will immediately say it's exactly the same story as yesterday, even though there were no real word and sentences in common. And that's because the human brain, basically, is able to do some abstraction step that we call conceptualization, which is transforming the words into concepts. And we remember the concepts. And if the day after that, I read the same story, but in another language, provided that the person speaks both language, he or she will perfectly understand that it's still the same story. And that time there is no single word in common. And that's exactly what you mentioned by changing architecture. The first difference is by recompiling in the same architecture. It's a bit like rewriting the story. And changing architecture is really like rewrite the story, but in another language. And as we see, our brain is capable of doing that. And computer software, now we have the possibility of writing computer algorithm that can do that. And that's what we call deep learning because it mimics the work of the human brain, of the brain in general, by the way, with neural networks. And it allows us to take, for us, it's not children's stories, but computer code. We take those computer codes, we transform them in what we call concept codes, 
which are basically the concepts of the codes. And then we make databases of such concept codes, of the legitimate concept code, the open source concept codes, the malicious concept codes, of course. And that's how, when we analyze a file, we are able to point that, okay, there is some code in it. We have some legitimate open source code, and that's perfectly normal. But we found specific concept codes that we know are malicious or linked to malicious activities. And that's how we are able to detect new variants of malwares, even if they share no single instruction in common with the previous ones. So Frederick, it's really fascinating, right? Because what we learning here is that malware can be detected statically. And it means like, okay, everybody know about this and everybody know this malicious and I've been attacked with it. And okay, the static engine detects that, but from what you're saying is actually taking it to the next level and detecting this malware dynamically, right? And this is really comes to address the concept of zero day attacks that never been seen before. So how your engine actually handles that, like how you do it? Tell us a little bit more about this. Yeah, uh, actually it's not dynamic analysis and that's the very interesting point. We still do it statically. So we work on the file statically and it's very interesting because the main problem with dynamic analysis is that it takes some time. When you put a malware in dynamic environment, a sandbox, for example, you have to wait one, two, five, ten minutes. You have to spawn one virtual machine for every malware that you analyze. So it takes huge resources and lots of time. And for example, for emails, you cannot do that on your emails. Some people do, but that means that the user received the email five minutes late and that they have a huge infrastructure to do that. So by doing everything statically, it allows us to handle the flows of files. And how do we do that? This technology that I described, the deep engine, this deep learning algorithm, we have integrated it into a platform, a full platform that orchestrates different modules for detection and analysis. That includes, for example, static unpackers, that includes the obfuscator engines, that also includes antiviruses, because as I said, for common threats, they are very good at that. Our AI engine is specifically targeted advanced malwares, variants of APT malwares, but the antiviruses allow us to have a very good coverage of all the kinds of malwares. And we also have some information extraction modules that allows us, in addition to all the detection that we do, to extract some valuable information, some indicators of compromissions, for example, this kind of thing. The goal is really to really provide a very good detection along with a very good investigation information. The way we do that is that all those modules that are described are put into the same platform and we orchestrate them one after another and also in parallel, of course, which means that when we get one file in the platform, all our detection and extraction engine won't see one file, but maybe five, 10, 20 files because we have extracted many subfiles from the input one. And for example, we have cases where you have a PDF document and it gets as a PDF document. So we don't run our AI engine uh, on this because there shouldn't be no code in a PDF document normally, but we have a dedicated module for PDF that will detect that there are some codes embedded. It will extract them, create a new file, and that file will get analyzed by our deep engine because it contains some code, for example. And we orchestrate all those modules, but still that takes between five, eight seconds. So it's very quick. And at the end, we have all this information. So this brings me to a very interesting part because what you describe is basically your architecture. And I think it would be great to show everyone that's listening and watching us right now the architecture of the platform and also the architecture of how you take files from email and from other information as well. Yeah, exactly. So let me share one picture that will explain this. This one here really shows how we integrate the platform within the environment. There are three circles here that I will describe because I didn't mention them yet, that are three interfaces of the same platform. And when I say the same platform, it's the same server, the same database of file within that platform. The first one on top right is what we call the kiosk. It's basically a web interface that anyone can use to submit a file and get a verdict. The idea here is to have something very easy to deploy Within a few minutes in a platform, we create an account and you just have to have an email registered with a good domain name and you can use the platform to have this kind of detection. So it's really aimed at any employees of the company. On the left side, we have what we call detect. 
it's an API, an interconnection API of the platform with all the other systems of the environment of our clients. Basically, security solutions like EDRs, source, these kind of file sources, where we already have some security feature, but we will complete them by, for example, enriching analysis when there is a suspicious behavior on one endpoint. For example, we will retrieve the file through the EDR analyze it and confirm or remove the threat, for example, from the EDR. And also basically any kind of files, like emails, of course, like file shares, everywhere where there are files, we will be able to connect the platform and analyze those files. So those are the main two sources of files Kiosk can detect. And then there is a third circle, which is expert. It's another web UI, but aimed at security teams. The goal here is really to give information to security teams. All the information that we extracted, all the detection that we did during the analysis, we provide all this information to the security teams because for us, it's one thing to say that file is malicious. It's another thing to explain why we said it's malicious. And also which additional information we can have and we can give to those security teams to react. For example, extracting an IP address, this is an information that won't make a detection by itself, but for an analyst, it's a crucial information because it tells them what is the next step to carry out in the in the incident response phase, for example. And this interface is really aimed at anyone in the security teams because we really orchestrate all the tools of a malware analyst. Of course, malware analysts are very happy with the product because they are really more efficient, but also people that are not malware analysts that are SOC analysts that just have to handle one incident, they don't know how to analyze a file, they don't know how to deobfuscate it, how to uncipher base64 strings, all this kind of thing. But since we do that automatically, they know that if those deciphered base64 strings, which they don't even know about how it works, if those strings are IP addresses, they know how to use this information. Very interesting. And I have a question about the architecture. Let's say that you detected the malware for one of your customers. Would any other customers of yours be notified about similar malware so you can detect it on both of the customer systems? That is a very important point because actually that's not really something that we do because we have a very strong commitment around privacy, which means that when we deploy, even if it's in SaaS and we operate it ourselves, when we deploy a platform for a client, we don't get the files from this platform. We don't look at the files from this platform. It means that the client itself can share the analysis with us. When he uses the expert UI, there is an option with a button that creates a unique link that he can send us so that we can see this specific analysis. That's just a feature to share any information with us or with anyone else. But we don't access the file by themselves. So actually, that means that if one of our clients get a threat, it won't be used to protect other clients. So that might be a pitfall. But for us, it's very important because we work with very sensitive clients and even non-sensitive clients that seems non-sensitive because they don't work, I don't know, in the defense sector or sectors like that. But in the end, if you talk with a video game editor, what are they going to say? Okay, we are a very sensitive client because we have source code of our game. And even above that, we have personal identification information for our players. So those are very sensitive clients. And in the end, when you take a look, you quickly discover that Almost all clients are very sensitive ones because PYI, identification information, has become a critical asset and the reputation of the company can really be destroyed by this kind of information. So it's very important for us that the files of our client that they use for detection, that they send to the platform, stay on the platform and nothing can come out. Of course, concretely, in the real world, our clients quite often share information with us because they've seen something thanks to the platform. So they like to share this information to ensure that we are good at detection in next version and everything. But we don't do it by default. That's really an explicit action from the client itself. This brings me to another question. When you detect a malicious portion in a file or malicious code that's hidden in the file, how you share this information with the user? Do you say explicitly, 
this is malicious or not malicious? Or you say, we confident 60% that it's malicious and this is the proof that it's malicious, but it's kind of, you know, defer the decision of malicious or not to the client itself. Our goal is to give information once again. We give a scoring of the threat, which can go anywhere from zero to a few thousand points. And we consider that 1,000 points is a real threat and is a malicious fire. An antivirus that detects a fire, our deep engine, for example, that detects a fire as malicious will give 1,000 points. In some cases, it's our job to know how our antiviruses work, for example. And sometimes we degrade some specific heuristics because we've discovered that some specific antivirus have a high false positive rate on some specific threats. So in this case, we say, okay, this specific threat, when these antiviruses say that it's this threat, don't give 1,000 points, but give 800 points, for example, in order to avoid those false positives. So we can tweak like that our detection engines. And then we say to our clients, we tell them, you have to look at the score. When you have, let's say, 5,000 points, that means that lots of puzzles detected the file as malicious. So it's pretty obvious that the file is malicious. It, it does not mean that it's a bigger threat, actually, but it means that it's a well-known threat. When you have 1,800, 1,200, for example, points, that means that only one module really detected the file as malicious. So maybe that's where you have to spend time. And that's where you have to look to ensure that this threat is either a false positive or is a dangerous threat because it's a new version of a malware, for example. And by doing that, we really spare the time of the analyst and this allows them to look for more threats. They can sort the threats, so the first important part, but then by being more efficient, by knowing which threat to analyze and by spending just 30 seconds analyzing a threat, they can analyze more and go to those threats at 600, 800 points for example, that antiviruses won't block, but that might convey some malicious information. Frederick, 1,000 words is great. Sometimes one picture is much better. Can you do a demo and show how it's actually working? Sure. I will do a short demo of how it works. So here I will share what we call the kiosk. So that's the web interface that anyone can use. And this way you even have my email address if you want some more information. Here, it's basically a glimpse. We registered the domain within the platform, which means that any employee with an email address with this domain can use the kiosk. So that's very convenient, very easy to deploy for another client. We just have to add the domain of the client. I already clicked the link, so I received an email. And when I received this email, I can just click on the link that's in the email, and I go directly to the web portal where I can upload files. So that's very straightforward. And the goal here is really for anyone to use it. We've already deployed it for 2 million people with a very big project in France. So you can imagine that it scales up quite well. And the goal is really to have something very easy to use and that 2 million people can use daily. Once you're here, Okay, I'm a user. I want to send the file. I have this HTML file for which I have some doubts. I send it to the platform. And as you will see very quickly, okay, this one was really quick. Very quickly, you have the result and this file is detected as malicious. We even have some additional information here that can be customized for the domain name, which means that you can here put the email address or phone number of the size of the company, for example, that's very convenient also for the users. And as an end user, as an employee, for me, my job is finished. I send the file, I know it's malicious, I know I won't have to use it. You mentioned something about scoring. Can you show examples? Yeah, because here we'll go to the backside of the solution, the expert UI. That's what we have on the SOC, so for the security teams, and they, they have all the analysis that went through the platform and they can really see all the files that went through the platform. And here we have this one here that comes from the kiosk from Frederick Google. And we see that it's malicious with a score of 3000. As an analyst, I want to get more information about the file. So I will go in the detailed page where I have the results of the detection, for example. So we have all the files that are extracted. I think that in this one, yeah, it was a zip file that was protected by a password that we can find here. So it's a common password used by malware analysts in order to protect their own computers when we handle files. So we had a zip file with the password infected. We extracted another file, which is the real payload. And I can predict some information, for example, and 
most important thing, I can directly view this file and see how it looks. Here, that's a section rendering that we do on the platform that allows the analyst to have a preview of the file within seconds. And in this example here, it's uh, really straightforward. It's a file that aims at copying an authentication page from Microsoft that to steal credentials. So really quick for the analyst to have all those information. The goal really is to empower him and allow him to spend something like 30 seconds at most when there is a file to analyze. And just to finish on this one, we also have all the domain names, IP addresses, mail addresses extracted from the file. And here you will see quite quickly that there is especially this one here. And I think there is another one, the PHP here. And this one here, which are two URLs that have nothing to do in this file. And here as an analyst, without even taking any tool, without even downloading the file on my computer, because it was uploaded by a user through the kiosk, I already have previewed the file. I know what it looks like. I already have extracted two URLs that I have to look for in my proxies, for example, or to block, depending on where we are in the kill chain. And I really took less than one minute to do that. And that's really what we want to provide to the users. That's really solid demo. Well done. And let's talk a little bit about the deployment of the product, right? So many companies are running today in the cloud and that's where the data center. But again, if we're talking about sensitive companies and their workloads, usually running in some type of either self-hosted cloud or hosting, or even in some cases in air gap environment, if it's something that is highly secure. How can I use your product in all of these type of deployments? Yeah, that's really something that we wanted to do from the beginning, because we know that sensitive clients want, especially air gap, for example, uh, air gap platform. I know that's not very common. Not everyone does that. Most security vendors now turn to cloud-based solutions. But still, there is a huge market. Going for cloud-based only solutions does not mean that there is no market for on-prem and air gap solutions. It mostly means that it's more convenient <laughs> to do that. So we really wanted to take another approach because we know who our clients and sensitive clients are. And that's why from the beginning, we've provided along with cloud-based solutions. We do also on-prem solutions for clients that want to deploy in their own data centers or in their private cloud, which is what we mostly see. And we provide air gap setup. And we have a partnership with Thales, the French security company, that provides a hardware diode, which allows us in air gap environment to still have all the updates flowing through the diode and then update the solution with the same security results as our cloud solution. Which means that even for the antiviruses that are in the solution, within at most, I think, four hours or two hours, I don't remember, two or four hours after there has been an update on the public version of the signature database, it will be sent through the diode and updated through the AGAP solutions, which means that our AGAP clients have the same level of security as any other one. While for most solutions that work in AGAP environments, you receive, for example, that's something that I have seen quite a lot, you receive a disk, a Blu-ray or something like that uh, once a month with all the updates and you upgrade your solution only once a month, for example. For a cybersecurity threat, I think it's very important to be more on the edge of the latest threat. This amazing information and a lot of good info. I have a couple of even small topics I wanted to ask. And one of them, like big companies like JP Morgan get billions of attacks a day or attempts in attacks a day, let's put it correctly. I'm wondering how many files you guys scan like a day, a month, a year? What do you guys see on your platform? It's in the amount of hundreds of thousands of files a day, for sure. We're working on improvements to be able to even beyond that up to millions of files per day per platform. That's our current goal. I mean, tens, tens of millions of files per day per platform. So we're working on that. And we have no real constraint. The architecture of the product itself works around Kubernetes cluster, and we can add nodes, add compute nodes, basically. And we have no real constraints about that. So we can go very high in terms of volume and amount of files. Eric, thank you very much. I think it was amazing. A lot of good information, and I learned a lot myself as well. Thank you, Frederick. Thank you both. <laughs> Please remember to subscribe to our podcast and join us for our next episode.